This sermon, entitled Self-Examination, was delivered by Asael Nettleton in America's Second Great Awakening, and he takes his text from 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? The Corinthians to whom Paul wrote were disposed to inquire whence he derived his authority as an apostle, and to seek a proof of Christ speaking in him. But he exhorted them to turn their attention to themselves, and examine into their own spiritual state. As there was great danger of self-deception in relation to this momentous concern, this was the most proper employment for them. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? The duty enjoined in the text is no less important to us than it was to the Corinthians, and is as binding on professors of religion now as in the days of the apostles. There are two thoughts suggested by the text. One, a person may be a Christian without certainly knowing it. Two, he who is a true Christian may know it. The first of these propositions is sometimes denied. It is said that the change in regeneration is such that made with hands eternal in the heavens. And thus also the Apostle John could say, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Here the Apostle's assurance is twice asserted. Now are we the sons of God, and we know that we shall be like him. Again, we know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. From these and other passages of Scripture, it appears that Christians may arrive at the full assurance of hope, and that some actually have attained to this assurance in the present life. It is a privilege to which all are exhorted to attain. We desire, says the Apostle, that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Again, wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. And again in the text, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Although the full assurance of hope may not be common among Christians, yet we see that it is attainable. We are also taught how it is to be obtained. It is by self-examination and by giving diligence. It is owing to the neglect of these that Christians often walk in darkness. It is also owing to the neglect of self-examination that many are filled with a vain confidence. They are disposed to think well of themselves and to take things for granted without investigation. Hence, they take up with a false delusive hope, go through life deceived, and at last awake in awful disappointment. How important it is that the Christian, be ready always to give to every man that asketh him a reason of the hope that is in him with meekness and fear. And how important that those who are resting on a false hope should be brought to discover their awful mistake and to inquire in earnest, what must we do to be saved? The difficulty of settling the important question whether we be in the faith does not arise from any defect in the rules laid down in the word of God. The evidences of regeneration there stated are plain and numerous, too numerous to be considered in a single discourse. Some of them, however, it may be proper here to mention. Love to the moral character of God. Faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance for sin. Love to the duties of religion. Love to the brethren. Many others might be mentioned, but 
Let these suffice for the present. Respecting the evidences here enumerated, it may be observed that they are all sure. Each one has the promise of salvation. The person, therefore, who possesses one of these Christian graces is interested in the divine promises. And he who possesses one possesses the whole, though some may be more clear than others. So also, if a person is destitute of any one of these evidences, he is destitute of all. And it is certain that he is not a Christian. If a person has true love to God, it cannot be said that he has no faith, no repentance, no love to the duties of religion, or no love to the brethren. Now in the business of self-examination, there may be several difficulties. I will mention two which are perhaps the most common. The first is, when persons who are sensible of no real change in their views and feelings attempt to collect evidence when no evidence exists. Such persons, being ignorant of their own hearts, may perhaps be resting in the externals of religion. Here it may be proper to observe that let the external conduct be ever so correct. If the feelings of the heart do not correspond with the rules of the gospel, it can be no evidence of a justified state. On the other hand, let a person's experience be ever so satisfactory to himself, yet if his general conduct does not comport with the rules of the gospel, this can be no evidence that he is a Christian. Works without faith are dead works, and faith without works is a dead faith. Gospel faith and practice are inseparably connected. Persons may, and often do, for a long time search for evidence when it does not exist. It is not to be taken for granted that the result of every examination will be favorable. Thousands may flatter themselves that they are Christians when they are not. And although in some cases there may be a real difficulty in deciding on which side the evidence preponderates, yet in many cases the evidence against is clear and decisive and the persons could not fail to see it if they would look to the subject with candor and with a sincere desire to know the truth. In such cases, the whole difficulty lies in a reluctance to give up an old hope. The individuals concerned are unwilling to believe that their case is so bad. They cling to their old hope for fear they shall never find a better. The other difficulty to which I refer exists in such a case as this. A person is sensible of an important change in his views and feelings, but for want of information is unable to discriminate between true and false religious affections. He has new views, new sorrows, and new joys, and has no doubt that a change of some kind has taken place. But is this the change required? Is it regeneration? This is the question which he finds it difficult to decide. Although it may often be difficult for a person to determine, on the whole, that he is a Christian, yet in some cases it might not be difficult for him to determine that he is not. There are certain infallible marks of an impenitent state laid down in the Bible. The following are some. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. While a person lives in the indulgence of any one sin here enumerated, 
It will be of no use for him to search for evidence that he is a Christian. Let us now consider the positive evidences of regeneration. The true Christian loves God. He that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Here is something new, something pleasant and delightful. Now the question is not whether he possesses love of any kind, but whether he loves God for what he is in himself. Whether he is pleased and delighted with his moral character because of its excellence. If this is the case, it will be the language of his heart. Whom have I in heaven but thee, and there is none on earth that I desire besides thee. He who has no love to God should conclude that he is a stranger to piety. For he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Again, the true Christian believes in Christ. He receives him as his Savior and rests alone upon him for salvation. In himself he is lost and justly condemned to everlasting death, and he despairs of all help from every other quarter. But now the Savior is unspeakably precious. He sees a beauty in his character and a glory in the plan of salvation which fills him with joy unspeakable and full of glory. He counts all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus as Lord. He is willing to commit his soul, his eternal all, unreservedly into his hands. Of the power and willingness of the Savior he has no doubt. The only question with him is, am I willing to embrace him and trust in him? On the other hand, the person who says in his heart, that he would trust his soul in the hands of Christ if he knew that he would save him, who thinks that he is willing and that Christ is not, has no evangelical faith and no good evidence of an honest interest in Christ. Again, the true Christian possesses evangelical repentance. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Here the question to be decided is not simply whether a person has sorrow on account of his sins. For there are two kinds of sorrow, selfish sorrow, or the sorrow of the world which worketh death, and godly sorrow which worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. Selfish sorrow for sin, which arises from the fear of punishment, is the sorrow which Judas felt when he had betrayed innocent blood, and the sorrow which the lost spirits in hell will feel to all eternity. But godly sorrow, or true repentance, flows from supreme love to God. It implies hatred of sin on account of its own odious nature. The true penitent has a broken heart, and this is his language. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Against thee only have I sinned and done evil in thy sight. Though forgiven of God, He feels as if he could never forgive himself. The true penitent may sometimes doubt whether his repentance is genuine. But he who has no repentance, no sorrow for sin whatever, need entertain no doubt respecting his spiritual state. He may know that he has no interest in the divine favor. For except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Again, The true Christian loves the duties of religion. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. He loves to read the scriptures, to meditate on divine truth, to pray and to practice all the duties of religion. He feels differently at different times, but that he takes delight in these things, he has no doubt. The only question with him is whether he attends to these things out of love to God, and the supreme regard to his glory, or whether it is merely to quiet conscience and to build up a self-righteousness. He knows, for example, that he must maintain secret prayer or give up his hope. Now it is proper for him to inquire whether he does not continue the practice without any love to God, merely to keep alive his hope. If he has grace in his heart, He will delight in the law of the Lord after the inward man. It will be the language of his heart. I esteem thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. 
If there were no future state, he would be unwilling to give up his present pursuits. He would still love to meet with the people of God, to read and hear his word, to pray and praise. He would still speak of the glory of the Redeemer's kingdom and talk of his power. On the other hand, he who does not delight in these things, but uniformly esteems the service of God a weariness and a burden, and more especially he who lives in the constant neglect of known duty, need not doubt as to his character in the sight of God. He may know that he is in the gall of bitterness and bond of iniquity. For he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Again, the true Christian loves the brethren. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. Here is danger of deception. Perhaps no person, whatever may be his character, can help respecting and approving of the Christian character. Virtue is certainly preferable to vice. To the truth of this sentiment, the judgment and conscience of every sinner are constrained to give their assent. The person will scarcely be found who will acknowledge that he prefers a vicious to a virtuous character, or that he loves the sinner and hates the Christian. But although the judgment and conscience may approve of the Christian character, and although a person may love Christians because he considers them as friendly to him, this is no evidence of regeneration. If ye love them that love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. But that love which is evincive of the new birth is entirely different from this. The true Christian loves God's children because they belong to Christ and bear his image. This is the love of complacency. He delights in the society and heavenly conversation and esteems them the excellent of the earth. Thus, my hearers, I have attempted to lay before you the evidences of a gracious state. Each one of you must examine for himself. No mortal can decide in your case. In this business, every individual must sit in judgment on himself. Deal faithfully with your souls. A false hope is worse than none. A mistake in this momentous concern is awful. Beware of building on the sand, for the trying hour is coming. Our business lies with the heart-searching God. Examine well the foundation on which you rest your hopes of heaven, lest you discover your mistake too late. On whatever foundation you build, remember well, remember all that you are building for eternity.